everybody to our webinar series of Future by Design. Today's topic is creating the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. We have two amazing leaders in their fields uh, and at Singularity U and in their own right, in their own domains. So I'd love to welcome Dr. Tiffany Wara and Jeffrey Rogers who are also guests, our international guests on our executive program coming up on the 16th of November. So welcome, um, Dr. Tiffany Vora, welcome Jeff Rogers. And I'd, I'd love you to, to tell people in your own words a little bit about your backgrounds um, and how you came to be in the positions in the fields um, where you are. So maybe Tiffany, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, welcome, thank you. And yeah, give us a little bit of background. Hi, Christina. Thanks so much for inviting me to join you and all of our friends from Australia. Uh, so I'm a molecular biologist by training. I, when I was an undergraduate at New York University, I studied biology and chemistry. I worked for a pharmaceutical company for a little while after that. And then I went to graduate school. I did my PhD at Princeton. Uh, and then I was actually a university professor in Egypt at the American University in Cairo for a couple of years. That was before the revolution. And then when I came back to the United States, I taught at Stanford for a bit and I started a company. And uh, then I joined Singularity University as a faculty member. And I've been lucky enough to be working with SU for just about five years now. So I live here in Silicon Valley. I get to watch tech, I get to watch startups, I get to watch NGOs and companies and just everybody figuring out how to build the best possible future. So I'm lucky, I've been in industry, I've been in academia, I've done startups. Um, I've been really lucky to be able to see a huge swath of innovation and leadership. Thank you so much. And it's been an absolute pleasure to have worked with you um, on a couple of different occasions and spent some time with you at some of our global summits. So thank you for your energy and, um, and everything that you do. Jeffrey, a bit about your background and how you came to be where you are. Absolutely. First, thanks for having me. Uh, happy to be here with you, Christina, and also always happy to share the stage, share the screen, share any venue I can with Tiffany. Uh, Dr. Vora, lovely to see you. Um, briefly, I always find myself a little bit oddly positioned for conversations about the future because I started out academically as a historian. I came to the San Francisco Bay Area to do a graduate degree in American environmental history at Berkeley. And uh, one thing kind of led to another. I realized I was never going to be a great historian, but uh, I found a little bit of a niche for myself as an educator. And I left Berkeley after my master's degree, never finished my dissertation, and bounced between kind of early ed tech in Silicon Valley and doing mostly experiential youth leadership programs at the start of my career. And now I've been an educator for about 15 years and filled a lot of different roles as an L&D professional in uh, the private sector, in the public sector, working with nonprofits, working with ed tech companies, and eventually, oddly enough, found my way to Singularity University and had been a fan of some of the principles involved from way back and joined as the organization's first director of faculty development uh, at the end of 2015 and then moved into mostly a facilitator role. And I'm a generalist and really interested in being along with people on their journey, their learning journey through kind of the, the S universe, if you will. And uh, that's how I know you, Christina. That's how I know a lot of people in the community. And it's a journey that I still find really inspirational and exciting to be part of uh, as we move forward. Um before we move on to, so there's a lot of things there that I'd love to pick up on um, with both of you there, but Jeff, you use the term generalist and it, it hasn't always been um, a term that people have been very complimentary about. And I think I very much relate to that. I had a conversation quite some years ago with a, a gentleman who had worked with Steve Jobs and he'd worked with, um, he'd worked with Spielberg designed Porsches, all this kind of thing. And, and I sat down and I said to him, how did, why did Steve Jobs employ you? And he said, well, funny you asked that. I asked Steve that over coffee. And I went, well, you know, I'd love your resume, but I'd also love to have been um, a fly on the wall when you had coffee with Steve Jobs. And he said that Steve Jobs had employed him because he knew a lot of things about a lot of things. Uh, he said, I wasn't a specialist in any one field. So it was very much that term generalist. Can you, in your experience, what does being a generalist mean and how has it almost come into its own? Um, and this is for me very pertinent when we're discussing creating leaders of tomorrow, because I, I actually think it's a, it's a fine attribute for leaders of tomorrow to have. So in your experience, generalist is 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm speaking as a little bit of a biased generalist here, I suppose, but um, the, the importance I see of having a generalist involved, not necessarily that everyone needs to be one, but some of the value that they can bring to any project or initiative is helping with the connective tissue. That's a lot of what I've seen my role as, as a facilitator, helping people make perhaps novel connections, maybe helping them step out of their comfort zone a little bit, maybe out of their narrow niche specific domain and thinking about the broader context. And if we take seriously the idea that we are living in an era of accelerating change, I think having that heightened contextual awareness and being able to see outside of my kind of narrow focus and understanding how the world around me is changing so that that can inform how I update my practice and build a little bit more adaptability and agility going forward. Um, that's a lot of how I think of it. Mm. Um, Tiffany, in your experience, because you are a, an amazing specialist, but I, and I don't mean to place you in a niche because I know that you have a, a wide um, amount of experience and knowledge in your field. Have you, like, so you and Jeff have connected before, you know, we've connected before. How is having a generalist in the room um, been beneficial in some of the conversations, some of the facilitations, et cetera, that you've been involved with? Well, I think Jeff hit it right on the head with the word connections. Um, Jeff is actually one of the most talented facilitators I've ever had the pleasure to work with. I know, oh my goodness. Uh, but really his ability and any generalist's ability to extract the things you really mean, the things you think you're saying, but you're not really saying, sometimes the opposite of that. It's really very exciting. And I know for me, Christina, you just told me that I was a specialist. But what's funny is that often when I'm working with other scientists, they think I'm a generalist because I'm able to talk about AI and autonomous vehicles and machine learning and all kinds of other things, solar power, mostly because I've spent so much time in the S universe, as Jeff calls it. So I'm really lucky because I've gotten to not only deepen my, only, my own subject matter expertise, but by being in the room with other Singularity University faculty and all the amazing people who come to our programs, I have grown so much in my knowledge. And honestly, I think a generalist's greatest talent is asking questions, not answering them. Because at the end of the day, a real leader knows which questions to ask. I love that. And I, and, and I truly didn't mean to um, pigeonhole you in any way, shape or form because we've had many conversations and I know your experience and your knowledge is vast and amazing. Um, so in, in with both of you and having been involved in so many leadership programs, let me just go generally in leadership at the world. What are you noticing to be the most, um, no, not desired, that's not the right word, the most crucial factors um, of leadership going forward. Jeff, I know you said that you had worked with leadership with youth, which I think is absolutely um, crucial in, in that whole element moving forward into whatever brave new world we're moving into. But what are some of the crucial, the most um, effective attributes that you've noticed in leaders that you've both worked with? I might, Tiffany, I'll ask you first. Sure, so the two words I wanna use are actually two words that we're often seeing uh, applied to supply chains these days. And those two world words are robust and resilient. How well can you handle any given shock in the moment? And how well can you recover after a major shock? And I think if we wanna talk a bit about COVID and what's that exposing in our world, I mean, it's really, this pandemic has ripped the cover off of a lot of things that we like to say, but aren't really true. Uh, a lot of people who claimed they were good leaders are turning out to not be good leaders and vice versa. Some of the greatest leaders I think are, are coming out of this pandemic from left field. So I think that as we're growing as leaders, knowing how to be in the moment and to find ways of thinking quickly on your feet, but with as little bias as possible and preferably with a close group of people around you who are willing to push back and say, no, that doesn't make any sense. No, you're asking the wrong question, whatever it is. Those things which are robust in the moment also set you up to be a resilient leader so that you're ready for next time. Mm, thank you. And it is very robust and resilient, definitely two very important attributes. Jeff, in your opinion, what are, the, what are some crucial attributes that leaders need to be showing right now? Sure, and I'm actually going to uh, broaden this beyond just my narrow perspective on leadership for the 21st century. And I'm gonna throw this back to uh, in 2019, Deloitte did their Global Human Capital Survey, which I think they do annually. And 
the number one competency that was identified for leaders to be building and emphasizing going forward was uh, the ability to lead effectively through complexity and ambiguity. And I think 81% of respondents identified that. And I think that's really important, right? And this year, of course, has, as Tiffany has already suggested, really kind of highlighted for us the, the criticality of being able to do those things effectively in a world of increasing complexity and in a moment where we are beset with uncertainty and we're navigating an awful lot of ambiguity. And for me, this is something that, this is not new, right? We've known that this was on its way. We've known that this was the world that we were moving into. We've been talking about it, but I think in 2020, with the dynamics of a global pandemic and the pressures that that's put on supply chains, on organizational structures, on individual leaders, that some of those things are perhaps newly and keenly felt, right? But I think big picture, this is an extension of kind of the shift that we saw in the 20th century as we moved away in advanced economies from um, a paradigm around industrial manufacturing and thinking about achieving and maintaining competitive advantage through scaling efficiency, right? Getting really good at those uh, complicated global supply chains and optimization problems. And as we moved further and further into an information and service economy, that, that paradigm shifted to reward not scaling efficiency, but scaling learning and innovation. And that's a different thing. And I think with that, there's a new emphasis on the ability to navigate a complex world and to sit with situations where you may not have a clear cut answer and have to work with tensions to be managed rather than problems to be solved. And all of those things, I think, get to that same idea. And for me, that's a lot of where we should be thinking about building our kind of scaling edge as leaders. It's a Thank Goldilocks you. problem, right? If you react too fast, then you make mistakes. But if complexity causes you to freeze, then you can't respond at all. So yeah, our leaders are trying to thread this needle and get right to that sweet spot while the world is going crazy around them. It's a really hard task. I think, and it makes you have a, or a, I think, I do believe that we need to be showing a lot more respect um, in some instances with some of the leadership that is happening, because I don't know many people that would want to step into some of the shoes um, that, are, that are taking leadership steps at the moment. You both mentioned um, almost bravery uh, in moving forward in, in the period that we're in. So COVID has accelerated changes in med tech, fintech, a whole lot of different issues. Um, how brave does a leader need to be? And where does, where does bravery take its seat and before it actually tips over the cliff and becomes maybe not so much bravery, but, uh, but maybe um, something where people shouldn't move. I'm, the word I'm wanting to use isn't very complimentary, but just how brave do leaders have to be right now in order to maybe look at completely new systems and new ways of thinking? So for me, the difference between bravery and arrogance is humility. Uh, so that's what I'm always looking for. Is a person assuming that they're right or is the person assuming that they're wrong? I feel much better about one than the other. What do you think, Jeff? I think that's beautifully put and I'm, I'm actually a little hesitant to try to add anything to it, but I'll, I'll tie it back to uh, the importance of being able to sit more productively with uncertainty, right? And uh, as, as you said in, in the, the last exchange, not be paralyzed by those moments. But I think there's an opportunity for leaders to, to really exercise their ability to ask good questions, but not necessarily be the ones to have all the answers, right? And I think that's one of the ways that we can more effectively navigate this moment and embrace a little bit of uncertainty as a material to build with is in having the bravery to pose questions that we don't know the answers to and empower the people around us to go out and find them and hopefully find the best answers rather than assuming that we already have them in our tool set. And that requires slowing down, right? It requires slowing down. It requires deep thinking, which means it requires time. And Christina, this is actually one of the things that I've really liked about the executive program. It's a time commitment. But because you're committing the time, you are committing the resources to slowing down, to doing the deep thinking, and to acting instead of just reacting. And I think that's a really strong strength and value proposition for your program. Thank you for bringing that up, actually. Because some, sometimes we go, 
three days, I can't take three days out of my busy schedule or, you know, to, but if you're taking three days out of a schedule to connect and to converge, I think the other thing for me is that convergence of minds, the convergence of mindset, the convergence of different technologies. We don't know what we don't know until we go and have the conversations around it. But yeah, very much. Thank you, um, Tiffany. It is that commitment of time uh, to put aside to learn things that we don't know to mix with people to find out to find out so yeah very much thank you for bringing that up um the convergence of thinking and the convergence of different technologies how has that played out in leadership examples that you might be able to share with us so um either of you i'm happy whoever wants to jump in first so converging minds converging texts as as good examples of leadership flowing on from that ask the right questions not necessarily have the right answers well, the complex questions that uh, Jeff has brought up mean that there can't just be one domain that has the answers. There's, there's no way. Our problems are way too complex, way too far reaching for that anymore. So I think a leader in some sense has to be a convergent thinker, but they also, I don't know, I kind of think of it as a hierarchical structure where you have people who have these verticals that you can rely on as uh, trusted advisors people whose opinions you don't necessarily agree with, but who you'll listen to. And so as a leader, I know that I'm always looking for people who disagree with me, which frankly, not that hard. Uh, but I think it's important to have that convergent thinking across industries, across points of view, across ideology, uh, ideological orientations, you know, any of these things, because that's where you get the connections, particularly surprising connections are places where I've seen some really cool solutions coming out of. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I, I think that there's, there's real power in um, something like a Singularity U Australia, something specific like an executive program perhaps to uh, convene a novel group and maybe arrive at some ideas that none of them would perhaps come up with on their own, right? Where you can show up with questions that other people can perhaps help you answer or maybe help you refine or ask new and different questions, right? That in itself is a pretty important thing, right? It's great to assemble in these groups where you can have your mental models tested, you can have your assumptions challenged. And I think right now to your question, Christina, it's not hard to look out in the world and to find these enormously complex problems or problems that have a lot of complexity and then also a lot of complicated technical challenges kind of bundled in together. And those things, as Tiffany said, absolutely reward an interdisciplinary or convergent perspective, right? Like take COVID, for example. This is something where to manage it effectively at the societal level, you probably need to have the epidemiologist, you need policy experts, you need people who can talk about uh, behavioral psychology, you need community organizers, you need people who can help communicate. All of these things need to come together to come up with a, an approach that has even a hope of being effective. Uh, similarly, think about the conversations that have really bloomed and I hope continue to around what, what the appropriate design for social media and networks looks like. This is not a problem that we can leave just to technologists and coders they may come up with what feels like an efficient technical solution, but when you're deploying that thing within a complex human system, you probably want to have people bringing a different perspective or a complementary perspective at least. And I think a lot of the most interesting challenges we're facing right now are the kind that don't sit neatly within one domain of expertise. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think also uh, there's some threads in there about that individual leadership. So whether we're leading um, ourselves, our families, a group of students, a huge organisation, small organisations, small businesses, whatever that is, there's this sense of um, personal development that is also crucial to leadership um, at the moment. Jeff, I know that you've that you've been across many executive programs and you've um, acknowledged and observed a lot of that personal development. Can you just give our listeners a little bit of um, a little bit of your experience in that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd be happy to. I think at this point, I'm about uh, 22 SU executive programs in, and everyone has been an absolute delight. And as a frequent program moderator and facilitator, I get to spend the entire week with these people. And first, I think as you've already gestured toward, it's it's really important to recognize what they're committing 
you know, in showing up for something like this. And we say, oh, it's, it's three days, it's five days, it's a huge amount of your schedule. But if you think about how important the conversations you're having are, if you think about how important actually taking some time out of your schedule to think about the big picture, to entertain new possibilities, to have these far reaching conversations about the future, that doesn't show up on most people's Google calendar very often. So it's a great thing to take that time. And I think having that focus time really allows you to sit a little bit more deeply with some of these big questions and some of these possibilities and take the time to make those novel connections, uh, not only between the, the discrete pieces of content, but also the people in the room and the people in the community. And one of the things that I, I see in all of the executive programs I've done with Singularity is the openness that people develop. Uh, maybe they don't walk into the program with it, but that they develop over the course of the week to ideas that maybe at the outset, they wouldn't have entertained at all to these novel possibilities, to the idea that maybe some of their assumptions that they brought in are wrong or are maladaptive in a context of accelerating change. And I think this is something that's really important. Again, if we take that idea seriously, that the world is always in the process of becoming something new, then we need to embrace a process of becoming something new ourselves, right? And that involves some letting go of things that we've brought to the table and a willingness to engage with things that other people can put on the table for us. And that's hard work. But again, I think the future is probably too important to be left just to the people who already identify as futurists. We need to grow that community. And this is a great way and a great place to do it and to kind of kickstart a practice that leaders can carry with them back to their organizations, back to the community, back to the family, uh, or wherever they have the opportunity to hopefully develop other leaders, right? And exercise some influence. Tiffany, I will ask you, how does it, like that personal development, how does that play out in leadership um, in your experience with people, either yourself or people that you've worked with? Well, one of the things that I see a lot at these executive programs, I tend to come twice in a week, um, usually somewhere near the beginning when we're doing more of the tech stuff. And then I pop in again at the end uh, to hear conversations, to have a meal with people, um, sometimes to wrap up an experiment that we're doing. And one thing that I've noticed is usually on the first day of conversations that I have, people are telling me why they've come to help their business. And by the last day of the conversation, they're talking about the things they want to do to change their community, to change their family, to change their country, to change the world. And so that's a really big sea change in what problem you think you're there to solve. It's not just making a little more money for my business. It's radically changing everything. And I think that's really exciting. Um, it's certainly something that I've changed uh, as a member of the Singularity community. So, you know, I trained to be a university professor and to be a researcher, like that's what I was taught to do. And since coming to SU, I've really expanded my, my mentorship, my training, um, the types of things I sign up for and I say yes to, all because now what I'm looking at is a bigger picture, you know, not just understanding this one protein, not just understanding this one gene, but understanding how humans can come together to, to build the future of life on our planet and on other planets in ways that I think means we're heading in a positive direction rather than a scary negative direction. And that again, like Jeff said, you've got to be willing to throw them some things overboard in order to do that. And that's a big ask, but I'm always impressed by how folks rise to that challenge. I love that. I remember walking into the executive program. I took part um, in, in Silicon Valley and feeling like I'd absolutely come home and I'd found, uh, found a group of optimistic, positive people who had their head in the clouds a bit, but their feet were very firmly planted um, on the ground and it was all about making things real. Uh, very much loved the opportunity to moonshot, which is something that we had not maybe had um, safe environments to do back in workplaces, in organisations, but having the ability to do that and then seeing where that could go. And I think the whole perspective around moonshots has um, escalated right now in any field that you're in because of the converging minds, because of the converging tech, because of the accelerated rate of change. I mean, we thought things were changing fast before, 
COVID certainly has thrown us, um, you know, that 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 extra speedball. Uh, in in your opinions and in your experiences in your own organisations and in your own fields, um, that whole acceleration of leadership, Tiffany. I love what you said before that you need to slow down in order to do it, and very much I believe that yoga, meditation, mindfulness, breathing has accelerated as well in order to help us deal with the accelerated change of everything else that that's going on but in your in your fields how do what are best practices that leaders um can show and that leaders can do in their daily lives with their teams um to show good leadership and to help other people step into potential leadership roles well one of the things that i've seen in science and medicine um in the last eight nine months has been an increased decentralization in order to get experiments done fast enough, in order to get samples sent fast enough, in order to get things published fast enough, or not even published, not even peer reviewed, just out where somebody can look at it, the old barriers, the old hierarchies have really been breaking down in science. And sometimes that doesn't work out. You know, science is a self correcting mechanism that has um, developed over uh, several hundred years. And so, by definition, that is a slow process. But by finding places where scientists and doctors can decentralize some of these things and say, let's get the information out there to as many people as possible. And that will itself accelerate the process of figuring out what information is good and what information is bad is something that's been really remarkable. Um, if you look on places like Kaggle, where there have been these open source competitions and open source collaborations to analyze large biological data sets. I mean, it actually, it brings tears to my eyes when I see it or labs um, at universities volunteering their lab space, volunteering their reagents, volunteering their own time in order to run other people's experiments. I mean, that's crazy talk. That's the complete opposite of how academia has always worked, right? Because that's a scarcity model where there's only so much money and only so much time. But now what we're seeing is the urgency is so great and the human spirit has been rising so strongly in this time that folks are overcoming that and really decentralizing a lot of that. So I'm really excited about that. Jeff, what are you seeing? Actually something that dovetails pretty nicely with this idea of decentralization. I think part of that, uh, that leaders sometimes don't take maybe as seriously as they, they should is really pushing some of that decision making to the edge and really empowering the people who are at the edges of the organization. I think that's where a lot of the interesting ideas are. That's where you have a lot of people who have, you know, a more significant interface with the customer or they are on the ground, they are at the front line. They should help you learn faster through decentralization, but you also then have to give them some freedom to indulge their curiosity. Right? A lot of organizations now are starting to talk about the growth mindset and the importance of the growth mindset and nurturing it. But I think one of the things that requires leaders at the core to do is to give up a little bit of control and get away again from optimizing for efficiency and instead think about what does it mean to optimize for learning. And optimizing for learning means being a little bit looser with certain processes, maybe embracing some more uh, of what we would have traditionally classified perhaps as failures, right? Learning through trial and error, that's a great way to do it. That's how nature does it effectively, right? And I think really looking to engage team members in things they're passionate about, things that they are uniquely well positioned to understand and to help you understand and finding what will fire their curiosity and devoting a little bit of time just to that thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to feel productive to you for it to be of value to them, which ultimately redounds to you and the rest of the organization over time. And I think that's something that we, we have an opportunity to get a lot better at, but we're making some moves toward it already. And Tiffany, something that you mentioned earlier as well sparked, because uh, we run SUAU TV on a Wednesday afternoon and we talk to a virologist, we talk to a researcher, we talk to um, an economist, small business operators, um, and bring all the, the how that is all intertwined now with, um, with what's happening around COVID and lockdowns and how, you know, world economies are changing and things like that. But I think one of the, one of the things that I have found in particular is that there's this newfound respect for the process of science. 
people have not known the process of research um, and the importance of what goes on in a lab and, you know, the, the whole process of how the trials happen and what does that, you know, a lot of people now know what a phase three trial means, whereas previously um, that, that wasn't available to most people or, or it just wasn't on their radar. So even that whole collaborative open sourced information um, that you're talking about has also opened the minds of a lot of, a lot of people uh, which brings me to my next question. So, and it, it almost alludes back to um, the comments and the, the conversation we had about generalists right at the beginning. As a leader, how important is it that you know um, bits of everything? So not, not so much that you are a generalist in the sense that we were talking about before, but how is it that, that you need to know, how do you bring the right people on board? How important is it to have the right team, you know, the right people on the bus as, as um, Jim Collins says in good to great how do you do that how do you find that how does that play out in real life in your experience um jeff in particular with the people that you've come across uh around the executive programs and tiffany in your experience in the fields that you do work in so jeff over to you first maybe I actually think that that might be a better question for Tiffany. Okay. Or that's why I thought you were throwing that one to Tiffany and then you came back to me with the executive program. So yeah. Tiffany, if you have a ready answer, I can avoid <laughs> just speaking wildly here for a moment. Sure, I'll, I'll go. So uh, first I just wanna to respond to what you said about people not knowing how science works. Um, that's actually kind of incredible to me because nothing in science is hidden. None of it is hidden. And do you remember when you were a kid and you were in school and you were forced to learn like hypothesis, experimental design, analyze, repeat, and you hated it, right? You hated having to do that, but that's literally what it is. It's a lot more fun than what we had to do in high school, um, but, but that's what it is. And um, when I was a professor in Egypt, actually, this was what I taught students. And then what we would do is say, this doesn't happen in the lab. This is just critical thinking. So let's go out in the world and find applications where we can actually use this analytical method to answer any kind of question. So that's me, the biased scientist talking. So I'll just set that aside. Uh, so we were talking about, I had a brilliant answer to your question and then I got worked up about the scientific method. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were talking about, um, help me out here. So we're talking about the, the attributes of leadership and, and how important is it to have a diverse team with you basically was a question. Right, here's my brilliant answer, a shared language. So if you are a leader and you suspect that your company is going to need AI for something or blockchain for something or whatever it is, you as a leader should start picking up a working vocabulary. That doesn't mean you have to be an expert, but it means that if somebody tells you they're using an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, your brain shouldn't gray out when they say that, right? You're never gonna be able to talk with the engineers purely in their jargon, but by having a shared language, you have a, a, the potential to ask questions in a way that the person listening to you is actually hearing the question that you're asking and that you're asking the question the right way. The more and more you get into technical fields, the more specific the words become. And so as a leader, I would encourage all of you to get some of these words under your belt so that you know what to ask and what not to ask. I think you've led me into, um, into something else that I consider to be very important in the leadership field. It, it, and it's that vision. It's being able to bring people along um, on a common journey that has a common goal. In both your experiences, how important is that vision, mission, values um, that are set up by organisation, some, you know, to tick a box and then get hidden in a bottom drawer, others to actually walk the talk and make that the central theme of everything that they want to do. Um, potentially, you've both got examples of good and bad, uh, good and bad instances where vision has been crucial in leading uh, an organization to the greatness that it can achieve and greatness being a very uh, a very a, a word that can be taken at so many different levels so for me something great can be having a ripple effect on on uh, you know on community um, on schools on whatever that is or greatness can also be affecting at a global level so what is it what are those how important in your opinions are vision mission values how much time should organizations and leaders actually spend developing them and really getting them across organizations. 
Tiffany bought me lots of time to think of smart things on that last one. So I'm happy to jump in and maybe even uh, connect these a little yep. bit. And sure. um, I, I do think that it's critically important to assemble a diverse team, right? And to be building new and novel partnerships as we're looking to tackle new and novel challenges. And I think it goes without saying at this point that if you want to have a diversity of ideas, you need to have a diversity of people involved, bringing their perspectives that are outside of your own lived experience to the innovation process, to product design, whatever it is that you're trying to do. But I think key to binding that diverse group together and making sure that they're all rowing in the same direction. And this becomes only more important when you start thinking about what Tiffany was saying earlier about the power of decentralization. If you're gonna have a decentralized or distributed system and make sure that everybody is actually working towards something common, then they have to have clarity on a shared mission or purpose, or I'll take it a step further because this is something I know Tiffany and I are both really interesting in, interested in. They have to be working along the same narrative, right? I think these are some of the things that really bind community together, that bind a movement together. And if you don't have that, especially when you're really looking to scale, you don't have very much. Something that works really well for a couple of people who are in close contact, that's not gonna hold up when you're trying to scale that thing to different contexts, across certain borders, uh, even just over time. But I think one of the ways that you can make something a little bit more robust is to actually design carefully around those values, around that core mission purpose, and to build a narrative of possibility, something that people are gonna be excited about, that they can see themselves participating in, that feels inclusive, and honestly, I think that's everything. And I think if we don't have that, a lot of the other stuff doesn't really matter. It only gets you so far. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think having a shared vision, a true North Star, not to have every single action that everybody in your organization or your group takes be in lockstep, that, then there's no innovation if you're doing that. But by having a true North Star, when conflict arises, when you have to make hard decisions, when you're doing experiments, a variety of experiments, and then you have to vote someone off the island, always keeping that North Star firmly in your mind, I think helps people get out of their turf mentality, helps them get out of a scarcity mindset and say, no, this isn't about what's best for me. It's about what's best for this future that we've agreed we're building together. Again, you know, I'm a scientist, so I'm biased. You don't become a scientist because you think you're going to get rich. You don't do it because you're going to get famous. You don't do it for the sex. You don't do it for the drugs. You don't do it for any of those things. You do it because you've committed to this vision of the natural world and how important it is to understand it. And that's what keeps you going through your 80 hour work weeks. And when you have no money and you have no time and you feel like you have no friends, it's the science that matters and you surround yourself with other scientists who are like that. I'm married to a scientist. Um, we're raising our son. Part of me wants him to be a scientist. Part of me isn't so sure about that, but certainly to be a scientific thinker and to look at the world around him and to see how beautiful it is and to care about it and to take actions that mean we're being good stewards of that life. That's what we do. And I would encourage every leader to find that North Star and to not just make it a PR blurb on your website, but to make sure that what you do as a company, as an individual is always pointing toward that North Star. And I think Jeff's heard me give this analogy before. And I know Jeff is a sailor. If you remember your Ralph Waldo Emerson, he talks about moving toward a goal. And he says, you don't have to go directly in a straight line. You can be like a sailboat tacking across a lake, right? A sailboat goes back and forth, back and forth to catch the wind as it blows. But at the end of the day, it's always making way toward that safe harbor. And that's what I think a leader needs to be prepared to do. It's a wonderful analogy. Can I, before um, Jeff responds, can I ask you, Tiffany, if to verbalize what your North Star is? Oh, wow. <laughs> Over to you, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> I think my North Star, the thing that I take every action that I do is what kind of world am I building for my son? Am I building a world that is beautiful and awe-inspiring and fair and all these things that I want? I mean, as a biologist, I'll, I'll speak to my Australian friends. When I see the numbers about what is happening to the Great Barrier Reef, when I see pictures of the reefs that I dived 10 years ago that are dead now, 
And I think to myself, this is the planet that I'm handing over to my child. I, I, I can't handle that. And that's what spurs me to make environmental decisions, ecological decisions, to talk to people about these things and to share my passion. Because I know I'm only one voice, but if every person out there hears one voice like mine for even five seconds, that collective action can make a big difference. And that's my North Star. That's what gets me up in the morning. Thank you for sharing that. And that is exactly what we want people to walk out. I've got to say, Jeff, I am going to throw to you in a minute, but that is exactly um, the whole concept of an executive program is to know that, that you can make a difference. An individual can make such a difference to their communities. And, and that is what we really, that's the message that we're pushing um, with the executive program. But Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Tiffany. That was very beautiful. Thank you. I'm not sure what you're handing over to me. Is this the North Star thing now at this point? What this is North Star. This is yeah. vision. This is sure. um, this is how how do we you know put all the leadership attributes together? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I I talked a bit already about vision, purpose, and and narrative. So I'll just say personally, I think my my real sense of a a personal mission or purpose that also has an awful lot to do with whom I decide to work with and partner with, what organizations I align with. Um, is always kind of around the same idea that I want to encourage and empower more people to live like the future is theirs to create and to lead that way and to learn that way and to go into their lives, their day-to-days and their dreams with the idea that what they do might matter. And it might not, but I think there's something that, that really speaks to me about what, what it means to be hopeful is that idea that what you do might matter and you should live your life accordingly. And I think one of the things that we really see in the executive programs that we've done with Singularity is a room full of people with incredible potential and connection and power and expertise um, actually step back a little bit and ask themselves at the end of the day, what really matters? Why are they doing what they're doing? And maybe asking some new questions that help them refine their purpose and their vision or maybe even arrive at a new one or a shared one with somebody who happens to be sitting across the table or in this case, across the Zoom platform in another country. Um, and there's real power in making those connections. And if they are around that purpose, then I think they have the potential to really go someplace powerful as well. Thank you. Um, and in both your opinions, because we've all been working um, on Zoom, for a little while and I know um, Tiffany you've got you've got um, very amazing ideas on on how um, how creating programs like this online actually saves time so when we were talking before about that time commitment we're actually saving a bit of time the connection capacity what have you noticed so for example we had a, a series of our faculty uh, do some uh, do a work on a TED talk series uh, and the comments that were coming back around, oh, that brought me to tears, oh, that really made me think, oh, that, you know, thank you for that. I feel, you know, you've actually verbalised something that I hadn't thought of before. And this is all over Zoom, not not a TED talk that was live on stage. And it, it got me thinking, you know, I can watch a two hour movie and I can be absolutely in tears over it. Um, it can bring me to absolute joy. So the screen isn't what the blockage is. I can feel very emotive um, connecting with people through a screen. What, in your opinions, is it that makes a, a good connection via um, a Zoom meeting or via, because there's, there's a, lots of different, um, you know, technologies now that we can employ, but what is it that's behind that you think that, that connects people um, in situations, whether it's a webinar, whether it's an executive program, whether it's a TED Talk, whatever that is? So for me, the experiences that have been the most successful are the ones that stay right from the beginning. This digital experience is not a replacement for an in-person experience. This is a different kind of experience. And I think once you put yourself in that mentality, a lot of the baggage, as Jeff has said, that we've been carrying around for so many years about the importance of being in the room, how you can only accomplish innovation by looking somebody in the eyes, those things start to break down. And I think what I'm finding is people who are doing these really great digital experiences are finding ways to grab onto the different modalities that are embedded within a Zoom platform. So one of the things that I'm enjoying the most in my Zoom meetings is having that chat functionality because having the chat functionality means we can be passing each other resources. We can be capturing things. 
we can be um, giving it aside without taking the whole train off the tracks. I really like that. And I like the fact that there is an actual record of what has happened. I don't necessarily have to sit there and take notes. The chat is doing it for me. And there's a transcript that comes out afterwards. I think that's fantastic. Also remember friends, anything you write in a private chat isn't really private, that's okay. Always assume your mother is reading your private chats. But I, I like that a lot because I know for me, um, my brain is always going at Mach 5 and it's hard for me to slow down. And so it's nice for me to be able to go back to things, to rewatch a video, to rewatch a part of a video. It's really, really very helpful for me. And I also find myself being able to consume uh, information and content in a different way. You know, if I can listen to a masterclass while I'm on my exercise bicycle, that's a good day for me because I'm nourishing my body and my mind at the same time. So I'm really excited about finding ways to think about what is it we want to learn? What is it we want to achieve in a session? And then how can I do that in a digital world that's not just good enough, but actually takes advantage of what's so special about doing things online. So just as a kind of a trivial example, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was the Singularity South Africa had their online summit. And one of the things they did was have a virtual uh, VR bush session. So a VR thing, right? Super cool. So stupid me, I tell my nine-year-old son about this. And we have now had family time in the VR bush um, at like seven o'clock in the morning on Saturdays. And I keep messaging our friends over at SUSA and I'm like, hey, we're back in the VR bush. Like, does anybody want to come? My son like just can't get enough of it. I would not have been able to share that experience with him if we had been in real life because it would have been prohibitive for me to pull him out of school and take him to South Africa. When I was there, I wouldn't even have been able to be with him, right? I'm working. So I would have had to ask somebody else to keep an eye on him. But instead using this virtual platform, I was able to help my kid get a taste of some of this really cool technology at home in our pajamas as a family on a Saturday morning. And that was awesome. Mm, I love that. It's, it's not either or, it's, it's, you know, this is something different. Yeah, thank you. Jeff? Yeah, I'll build on that. And I, I wanna emphasize three things. The first is really a direct build on what Tiffany was saying about the design intent can really go a long way toward differentiating that digital experience and making it truly valuable and memorable. And I think that, I think a lot of us have seen a move in the last seven or eight months from just trying to replicate or map the, the old physical classroom experience onto digital, uh, and really focusing on all the things that we lost. We were creating like a, a kind of shitty copy of a copy of a copy of an experience. And we wound up with something that was definitely lesser than. And I think a lot of people turned their nose up. They didn't even want to give it a chance. And now we've had enough time. We've run enough experiments. There's clearly enough interest for people to invest the money in building programs and learning experiences that are digital first. And they're actually better because they're digital in certain ways. And some of that is design and leveraging these new modalities. And I'm a really big fan with digital programs of putting people into breakout groups and giving them something to work on and actually leveraging the awesome capabilities of a digital world for doing like live real-time collaboration where everything that is, everything that is created is saved and it's easily shareable. You come out with so many artifacts when you do group work in a digital program, whereas and I, believe me, I love a good post-it session in a physical classroom, but that stuff becomes really hard to share afterward. And it's hard to go back and review all the things that your colleagues, your new thought partners did without you. That's hard to do in that old paradigm. But in digital, it's, it's very much facilitated. It's very much easier. I think that's one piece. Another piece has to do with the democratization, right? Generally speaking, the digital programs, because they don't require everyone flying being physically co-located, staying in a hotel, leaving their family, maybe leaving their, their newborn baby, um, you're allowed to tap into potentially a much broader range of participants of other minds for you to connect with in the course of this program. And that should create a richer conversation, richer experience, richer network, richer set of solutions emerging. And then the last piece, and I think this is really important, 
is this is actually an opportunity to approach as a leader. This is kind of a sandbox for thinking about the kind of leader that you want to show up as in an increasingly digital world. We should all be jumping at the chance to have meaningful interactions online. If you had asked me a couple of years ago, hey, Jeff, could, could I entice you to spend a couple of days or a couple of weeks working in a, a paradigm that in five years is going to be the thing that everyone has to live with because there's going to be a global pandemic and people can't get together anymore. You can get a sneak preview. I would have loved to have done that. And effectively right now we have an opportunity to think about immersing ourselves a little bit more deeply in that digital work world. So why not do that? This is a great time to experiment, to try out those new behaviors and see which ones you actually want to carry forward and build your leadership practice around. And because of the urgency, I think people are coming into these experiences with much more kindness, much more expansiveness, and much more gratitude. Whereas, you know, five years ago, oh, if, you know, Zoom failed, I would have, or, you know, my cat had jumped up during a Zoom call, I would have been utterly mortified. But you know what? Now everyone else is home with their pets too. So it's okay. We can just be humans with each other. I think that's pretty special. Yeah, I'd just like to add generosity onto that as well, because that's another attribute that I've noticed um, on, on some of our Zoom calls is that generosity of spirit. And I think also um, building on what you've both said, it gives uh, people that may not have so much had a voice in person have had a voice, as you say, um, Tiffany, in the chat, or because they might be in smaller breakout rooms, Jeff, more people are encouraged to have a voice. So I've actually noticed... A, an increase in generosity of spirit, but also um, a, a more even distribution of, of who is actually doing the speaking. Um, I can't actually believe that our time is up. That has been a, a wonderful conversation with you both. Thank you. And I know you've both um, offered so many words of wisdom and so much encouragement for the executive program, for online learning, etc. But I'm going to ask you to pull one more Jim, um, of wisdom from your from your experiences, from your knowledge, from you know, from your empathy. If you had one thing to say to the leaders of tomorrow, so we're creating leaders of tomorrow, and and to those leaders of today, what might be that one thing that you really want people to take away um, from you personally? So, Tiffany, I'm going to go to you first, uh, and go. What is the one thing that you go? just do this, just know this, just learn this, here's a gift. I think my one thing is life is a marathon, not a sprint. So take your time, get it right, slow down, find your team. Love it, thank you. Jeff? Um, I would like to emphasize that you too are an experiment, right? All of the things that you consider yourself to be today, these are kind of the accretions of past experiences, things that people have told you about yourself, stories that you tell yourself about who you are and who you can be, but that is not a fixed thing. You are a process and not a thing. You should be prototyping your future self boldly and finding good opportunities to experiment with who and how you want to be in this new world because it's gonna ask a lot of us. And so I think we should be open to the possibilities, not just for future, but also for future self. Thank you, Dr. Tiffany Vora, Jeffrey Rogers. I look forward very much to welcoming you both into the executive program um, 16th to the 19th of November. Uh, all the information will be in the, in the notes on the webinar. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. And I'm really looking forward to, um, to conversing with you in a couple of weeks. So thank you both very much. Super fun. Thanks for having us. Uh, and to everybody else, we've got another couple of webinars happening this week. We've also got SUAU TV Wednesday afternoons, Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 5.30. Uh, so please join us for the latest updates in what's going on with virology, with research, um, with the economy around COVID-19. Uh, join us on Thursday and Friday. We have uh, other webinars. Technologies of the Future is our Friday morning wrap, 9 o'clock, hosted by the wonderful Lisa Andrews. Have a wonderful day. We look forward to your company again. Thank you. Thank you.